The White House marks the 40th anniversary of NEPA by notching another arrow aimed at addressing climate change. Also, in the wake of the recall involving the world's best-selling hybrid, the head of Toyota now says he is coming to Capitol Hill. And the world's most popular search engine can now wield more power, literally, thanks to a ruling from FERC. From the Energy News Center in Washington, D.C., this is the Energy Report with Susan McGinnis. And good Friday morning. I'm Tyler Suters in for Susan McGinnis. Thanks for joining us for the Energy Report on this 19th day of February 2010. The Obama administration is taking yet another step to put climate change front and center. Yesterday, on the 40th the anniversary of the Protection National Agency Environmental and, and Policy and Act, the White House Council on Environmental Quality uh, issued draft guidelines addressing GHGs, adding them to the health risks that agencies must evaluate under NEPA. You see CEQ Chairman Nancy Sutley here. She proposed guidelines applying to any facility that annually emits more than 25,000 metric tons of carbon, or the equivalent amounts of other GHGs. That would cover all federal permits for coal-fired power plants, coal mines that emit methane, and other industrial facilities like landfills. The guidelines include new sections on both monitoring and mitigating GHGs. The 25,000 ton cutoff is consistent with EPA's proposed GHG regulation under the Clean Air Act. And the basis for that regulation, the finding that GHGs are indeed a health risk, is being challenged now in federal court. This morning, Toyota President Akio Toyota says he will indeed testify before Congress. Roundly criticized for his handling of recalls, Toyota will appear before lawmakers next week to answer questions about the safety of his company's cars. More than 8 million vehicles worldwide, including the Camry and Prius Hybrid, are now under recall. Toyota faces questions from three committees in Congress, starting with the House Energy and Commerce Committee. That will be on Tuesday. Investigators there have asked for documents related to the recalls, seeking information on how long the automaker knew of safety defects before actually taking action. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has now approved a request by Google to buy and sell electricity. FERC unanimously backed the search engine's application for, quote, market-based rate authority. But the Internet company isn't planning to use this new authority for retail purposes. Google has said its interest in power markets stems from a desire to manage its own energy supplies and also gain better access to renewable power. A spokesperson for the company has said Google has no plans to sell its energy management service or even speculate in energy markets. But that person does acknowledge that Google isn't completely sure exactly how it will proceed from here. The question is, why build new nuclear plants here in the U.S.? And the answer depends on whom you ask. But David Crane from NRG has a very simple answer, and that is electric cars. Yesterday at the Platts Nuclear Conference in the D.C. area, the CEO of NRG, you see him here, said he believes that electrification of transportation is coming and power companies must prepare for the new load. To that end, NRG is now planning two new reactors in Texas. Crane said short range will initially keep electric cars as niche urban vehicles and, quoting now, we want to electrify Houston, he says. He notes that companies in the U.S. and Japan are now stepping up production and says the trend in auto technology and electric use is unmistakable. Crane adds that new power should come from carbon-free sources and building needs to start now. NRG is now working with Nissan to sort through potential infrastructure issues with an electrified vehicle fleet. That's where we caught up with David Crane in the video you just saw meeting with him at a Nissan event in Los Angeles last fall. Also from the Platts Nuclear Conference this week, industry executives delivered a clear message here in Washington. It is now time for U.S. manufacturers to start investing in the nuclear construction revival. This week, the Obama administration awarded the first loan guarantee for a new nuclear plant. And this is a look at preliminary construction underway at Southern Company's Vodal plant outside Augusta, Georgia. And now the DOE has opened the door. Mike Wallace from Unistar says it's time for the private sector to step up. Asked how much of new projects like his Calvert Cliffs 3 would be sourced in the U.S., he said, quote, how much can we get? Existing nuclear plants were sourced primarily in the U.S., but as new building waned, much of that manufacturing capacity was shut down. So for now, the largest components for new plants must be sourced overseas. Wallace says Unistar recently held a pair of supplier conferences, and potential suppliers say they are ready to invest in new manufacturing capability, but they need to know it's real. In other words, they need to know the nuclear industry will be building more than just one or two isolated new plants. 
Energy Secretary Stephen Chu says that the loan guarantee to Southern announced earlier this week is just the beginning. The administration is asking for $54.4 billion in loan guarantee authority that could enable seven to eight new nuclear plants here in the U.S. Montana and British Columbia have now finalized an agreement on banning mining and drilling in a valley along the U.S.-Canadian border. This deal halts ongoing exploration and prohibits future development of coal, oil and natural gas in much of the Flathead River Basin. Montana Governor Brian Schweitzer calls the agreement the result of, quote, quiet diplomacy. But the Association of Mineral Exploration in British Columbia says the ban on mineral development will hurt that province's economy and is the result of what it calls political demands. Compensation will be sought for companies with existing mineral leases in that area, and Governor Schweitzer says he's working with the state's congressional delegation on legislation to buy out 218,000 acres worth of energy leases there. Well, icy cold weather has shut U.S. schools, even the federal government, in recent weeks. But in Canada, there's a different effect. It is shutting down wind farms. This is a look at what happened to a wind farm in Minnesota. And now Canadian Broadcasting reports the 33-turbine Caribou Wind Park in New Brunswick, Canada. It has now lost 20 days of operation because of blade icing. And you need to keep in mind, this wind park has been open and online for only three months. The site manager says a colder winter would have been better as precipitation would have been snow and not ice. The developer here is GDF Suez North America. It says it hopes that this winter is simply an anomaly. Well, as we wrap up the work week here in Washington, here is a look at some of the events scheduled around the Washington, D.C. area today. At 8.30 a.m., about 45 minutes ago, the NRC Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguard began a safety evaluation report review. That's taking place in Rockville, Maryland. Also getting underway at 8.30, the EPA Air Quality Modeling Subcommittee is holding meeting at the Science Advisory Board. The discussion here involves how certain scenarios would play out with and without implemented EPA programs. And then later this afternoon, the headline event today, Interior Secretary Ken Salazar is joining governors and representatives of Atlantic coastal states at the Interior Building. They will be discussing a regional approach to wind developments on the U.S. outer continental shelf. Clean Skies News will be there for that event. And that is this Friday morning edition of the Energy Report. Thanks for joining us here in the Energy News Center. Any suggestions or comments for us, you can reach us here in the nation's capital at contact at cleanskies.com. And you can also follow us throughout the day on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tyler Suters. We're glad you're with us. You're watching Clean Skies News.